And one of the people who I think was uh, advocating or talking about a different path forward is my next guest, uh, Jason Richwine. Jason is a public policy analyst and a contributing writer for National Review. He's also got two school-aged children here in the state of Maryland. Jason, thank you so much for joining me. And um, tell us about uh, what you thought in reference to schools closing for the rest of the academic year. Well, I have to admit I was pessimistic. I, I, I did not hold a lot of hope they would be open, but I tried to make my case for why they, sh- they should reopen. And the basic case is this, that although we are in the midst of a terrible epidemic, it's an ep- epidemic that primarily affects the elderly. In fact, just a couple of days ago, Maryland released data indicating that 60 percent, but 60 percent of all deaths originated from nursing homes. It, by contrast, uh, if you look at the deaths um, by age group, you find that of the 1,338 deaths that have occurred in Maryland, exactly zero have been to people who are under 20 years old. So that's sort of the most basic point here, that schools are not likely to be major spreaders of the virus. And, you know, I I read that initially, and I've been reading different um, studies, uh, different data regarding around the world what uh, children seem to, I guess, not we're not 100% sure if they are carriers necessarily as much as we thought of this illness. But, um, I mean, what are your thoughts on on what the, the plan is in the fall about maybe having these staggered, uh, you know, kids kids coming in on this staggered schedule? I think that would be very unfortunate. I, I think that there are much more moderate steps you could take to reduce viral spread within schools, simple things like avoiding school-wide assemblies, maybe having lunch in the classroom rather than in a crowded cafeteria. We can do those kinds of things. That Those would have minimal effects on learning. But as soon as you start having these weird, staggered schedules, it, it's it's very different from what children are used to. And you know, I hardly need to go into all the problems that occur when you suddenly have schools closed from loss of learning to loss of social interaction, uh, child care arrangements you mentioned earlier. And also, you know, one thing that, that's been overlooked in the past is that You know, teachers are oftentimes the people who first identify problems in a household, abuses and and things, and they can't do that kind of job right now. I I fear for what can happen when we don't have uh, responsible people in children's lives. Exactly. Now, one of the things that's going to be, um, I guess, to play devil's advocate here for a little bit, um, and the data I think is still kind of up in the air on this, that, well, so children may not uh, be harmed so much by the illness, but they could still spread it, right? Well, what does the data tell us on that? Yes. Yeah, so it, so admittedly, the, the, the data on this are not completely clear cut. I don't want to pretend that we know it, we know everything about this because we don't. But from what we do know so far, the data really are pointing in the direction that although children, of course, can get the disease, they're not totally immune, they don't get it as much as, as other people do. And they also seem to not spread it as much. Uh, the uh, Royal College of Pediatrics did a uh, review of this exact issue uh, a few weeks ago. And their conclusion was that the evidence, quote, consistently demonstrates reduced infection and infectivity of children in the transmission chain, end quote. So I don't want to pretend that there's no risk here. But what we have to understand is that we face risk all the time. There's all sorts of low probability events that we risk incurring when we even just go outside during the day. We need to stop fearing the virus so much and begin to think of it more as a risk that has to be weighed against the benefits. And the benefits here it, are our children actually getting a decent education. So that side of the equation really has to be weighted pretty highly. Well, and you say in this, in this uh, commentary in the Baltimore Sun, which I thought was really great, risk is not something to fear, but rather something to weigh. How do we get to a point where people are not afraid necessarily of the risk, but are instead weighing it as you suggest? I think part of it comes from trying to recover our normal sense of perspective, trying to get a sense of how the virus threatens us versus other kinds of low-risk events uh, for most people. Uh, I I noted in the piece that a couple of years ago, tragically, there were 188 children who died of the ordinary flu, uh, according to to the CDC. And as bad as that is, you know, no one was pulling their kids out of school in mass uh, because of that situation. And, you know, probably the biggest risk that the average person takes on a daily basis is driving in their car. There's a non-trivial risk that you might get in a serious accident 
every time you get behind the wheel. 40,000 people died last year on the roadways, but no one is proposing to ban cars. No one is proposing to change every speed limit in the country to 25 miles per hour. So if we're able to kind of get over the sort of immediate fear, the sort of the sensationalism, the headline grabbing things about the virus that you see in the media and try to more from a level headed perspective that compares it to other types of risks that we deal with all the time, then I think we'll begin to get a a more rational uh, take on the whole situation. Are we allowed to have that conversation right now? I feel like, uh, um, although it's probably the more reasonable and rational approach to take, I mean, uh, what have you seen from, especially from the, the, the article itself that you wrote, the commentary that you wrote, I think it makes a lot of sense. But I also wonder if we are at the point where we're kind of allowed to start having these conversations about weighing risks and what does that mean? You know, it's funny that, that a big obstacle to that is oftentimes that, that the people who take the more skeptical side or the, the side of, of opening up further are accused of uh, being selfish in some way. And I, I, I don't understand that at all. I, I, it seems to me that whether you're whether you favor the continued lockdown or you support opening up, neither one has to be an inherently selfish uh, take on the issue, because clearly, you know, Ending the lockdown is about more than getting our hair cut or, you know, getting that tattoo that we really want. And we're talking about uh, having the economy function. We need a functioning economy. And, of course, what I wrote about was schools, which, I mean, everyone understands the, the vital importance of those things. So when people say, you know, we do to loosen the lockdown, take a more realistic, rational perspective on what the risks are here, we're talking about trying to get society to function. We're not just talking about how, gee, I'd really love to go boating. You know, it, it's it's uh, far beyond that. I, I agree. And I got to ask before you go, um, in the article, you say you have two children. Is that right? How are two school aged children? How are they doing? Through I this? do. Well, you know, I mean, they're hanging in there. I, I would say that the most frustrating thing for me is that I would love for them to be able to play outside with their friends. You know, we have a neighborhood with lots of kids and they had been playing outside with them all the time. It was one of their major things they did. And, you know, frankly, I would be perfectly okay with it uh, to happen right now. I've discussed it with neighbors, you know, but so many are are just, you know, it's still a little bit too afraid. And I was hoping at one point that maybe everyone really wanted it to happen. Everyone would be okay with kids playing outside, but they just assumed everyone else was not okay with it. Uh, But it it turns out that um, there are a lot of people who I think are still – you're rationally afraid of what's going on here. It's, it's, it's to everyone's detriment. Well, we'll see what that looks like as the weather gets nicer and as kids start making more of that push. So thank you for joining me. My guest has been Jason Richwine, a public policy analyst and contributing writer for the National Review. And thank you for bringing this different perspective on school closings. It was my pleasure. So I want to talk with you about what you just heard from uh, Mr. Rich Wine and this, as I said, kind of a presenting a, an alternative view to the announcement yesterday that schools were closed. And um, I'm going to be honest with you. I agree with him. 